I don't want to put you to any trouble, Gatsby began quickly. How about the day after tomorrow? Fine, Gatsby said. I must get the grass cut, uh, get a few flowers. We must have everything right, old sport. When the day of the tea came, it was pouring with rain. Gatsby had sent a man to cut my lawn. At two o'clock, Gatsby sent over enough flowers to fill every room in my little house. An hour later, Gatsby himself arrived. He was wearing a white suit, silver shirt, and gold tie. He looked pale and tired. Gatsby sat down and tried to read, but he looked up at every sound. Suddenly, he stood up and said, I'm going home. Nobody's coming. Don't be silly, I said. It's only two minutes to four. So Gatsby sat down again, and at that moment, we both heard the sound of a car. As I opened the front door, Daisy stopped her car and got out. Why did I have to come alone? Daisy said with a little smile. Are you in love with me, Nick? I took Daisy's hand and led her into the living room. Gatsby stood there, very pale, his hands in his pockets. For half a minute there was silence. Then Daisy gave a little laugh and said, I'm so very glad to see you again, Jay. It's been a long time. Five years next November, said Gatsby, staring at Daisy. I went into the kitchen to get the tea. After a few minutes, Gatsby came after me and closed the door. This is a terrible mistake, he said. It's too late, old sport, too late. Nonsense. Go back and talk to her. You're both shy, that's all. I decided to leave them alone for half an hour. I went to the window. The rain had stopped now and the sun was shining. When I took in the tea, I made a lot of noise, but I don't think they heard a sound. Daisy and Gatsby were both sitting on the couch. There were tears on Daisy's face, but she was smiling. Gatsby's face was shining with joy. Their happiness filled the room. Oh, hello, old sport, Gatsby said as if he hadn't seen me for years. I want you and Daisy to come over to my house. You sure you want me to come? Sure of it, old sport. And so Daisy saw Gatsby's enormous house for the first time. That's your house over there, Jay? She cried excitedly. Do you live there alone? It's so big. I always keep it full of famous, interesting people, Gatsby told her. We wandered through the gardens. Daisy admired every flower, every tree, everything she saw. We came at last to the white steps in front of the house. It was strange to see them quiet and empty. Inside the house, we wandered through room after room. We admired the books in the library. All the beautiful rooms were empty and silent. We went upstairs and looked at bedrooms and bathrooms, painted in pale, rich colors. Finally, we came to Gatsby's own rooms, where we sat down to have a drink. Gatsby had never stopped looking at Daisy. Once he nearly fell downstairs. He was trying to see everything in his house through her eyes. He was like a man walking in his sleep. It's a funny thing, old sport, Gatsby said slowly. When I see, I can't believe. He put down his drink and opened two big cupboards. He began to take out shirts, suits, ties. I've got a man in England who buys me clothes, Gatsby explained. He sends things over twice a year. The brightly colored clothes covered the table and fell onto the floor. Silk, wool, cotton. The pile grew higher and higher. Suddenly, Daisy hid her face in the shirts and began to cry. I don't know why I'm crying, she said, but they're such beautiful shirts, Jay. I've never seen such beautiful shirts before in all my life. It was getting darker now, and the rain had started again. Daisy and Gatsby stood together, looking out of the window. I began to walk around the room in the half-darkness. On Gatsby's desk was a photograph of a tough-looking old man. The man was dressed in sailing clothes. Who's this? I asked Gatsby. Well, that's Mr. Dan Cody, old sport. He used to be my best friend years ago. He's dead now. 
Dan Cody had a big yacht, and we sailed around together for nearly five years. He was like a father to me. This was one of the few things that Gatsby told me about himself that was really true. But I did not know that then. I was going to ask Gatsby more about Mr. Cody, but Daisy suddenly cried out, Come back here, Jay, quick! In the west, pink and golden clouds had formed over the sea. Look at that, Daisy said softly to Gatsby. I'd like to put you in one of those clouds and push you around in it. I tried to go then, but they wouldn't let me. I know what we'll do, Gatsby said. We'll have Klingspringer play the piano. Gatsby found Klingspringer. He was a young man who lived in the house. In the music room, Gatsby turned on a lamp beside the piano. He lit Daisy's cigarette with a shaking hand. They sat down together on a couch, away from the light. Klingspringer sat down at the piano and began to play. In the morning, in the evening, ain't we got fun, he sang softly. When I went over to say goodbye to Gatsby, he had a look of surprise on his face. Gatsby had dreamed of Daisy for almost five years. Now his dream was beside him. He could not believe it. They had almost forgotten I was there. Daisy looked up as I spoke and held out her hand. Gatsby looked up too, but he didn't seem to know me. I went out of the room quietly, leaving them together. Seven. Gatsby's Last Party I didn't see or hear from Gatsby for several weeks after this. I was working hard and spending my free time with Jordan. But this was the time when everyone was talking about Gatsby. More and more strangers went to his parties. More and more strange and crazy stories were told about him. Everyone seemed to be talking about Gatsby. Then, one Saturday... I was invited to another of Gatsby's parties. Daisy was there, too, and Tom had decided to come with her. Perhaps it was because Tom was there, but the party seemed different. There was an unpleasant, uneasy feeling about it. But all the same people were there. They were drinking champagne as usual, dancing and laughing as before. Tom and Daisy arrived as darkness was falling. Gatsby went over to them at once. Then he took them slowly round the gardens, pointing out his most famous guests proudly. Daisy and Gatsby danced together. I had never seen Gatsby dance before. Then they walked over to my house and sat there together for about half an hour. Tom didn't seem to care. He found a girl he wanted to talk to, and the evening passed as usual. I could see that Daisy was not happy at the party. She hated all these laughing, shouting strangers. They didn't seem to care for anybody or about anything. By the time the Buchanans were ready to leave, Tom was in a bad temper. "'Who is this Gatsby, anyway?' Tom asked as he and Daisy were waiting for their car. "'Is he a bootlegger? A crook? He knows a funny lot of people. Where does he find them? Where does he get his money from?' "'Lots of people come who haven't been invited,' Daisy said. "'He's too polite to tell them to go. "'I'd like to know who Gatsby is and what he does.' Tom repeated, and I'm going to find out. As they got into their car, Daisy looked back at the house sadly. Gatsby was nowhere to be seen. I stayed late that night because Gatsby wanted me to. When everyone had gone, we sat on the steps together. Daisy didn't enjoy herself, Gatsby said. Of course she did. No, she didn't have a good time. I couldn't talk to her. I felt farther away from her than ever. It's hard to make her understand. And then Gatsby told me what he wanted. He wanted Daisy to ask Tom for a divorce. He wanted her to tell Tom that she didn't love him, that she had never loved him, that she loved only Gatsby. Gatsby wanted to take Daisy back to Louisville, where they had first met. Gatsby and Daisy would be married. Gatsby wanted the last five years to be completely forgotten. Gatsby didn't seem to understand how much he was asking. Don't ask Daisy for too much at once, I told him. You can't repeat the past. Can't repeat the past? Gatsby said in surprise. Of course you can. 
Everything's going to be the way it was before. She'll see. Gatsby began to talk about the time when he had first met Daisy. He told me about the first time he had kissed her. That was when Gatsby's dream had begun, and he had spent his life trying to make that dream come true. But no woman can be turned into a dream. I could see this, but Gatsby could not. He could see no reason why he and Daisy should not be happy forever. Eight. The Hottest Day of Summer It was when everyone was talking about Gatsby that his party suddenly came to an end. One Saturday, there were no lights in Gatsby's house or in his garden. A few cars drove up to the house, but almost immediately drove away. I wondered what was the matter. I decided to go over and find out. A new servant opened the door. Is Mr. Gatsby sick, I asked. No, he said rudely. Well, tell him Mr. Carraway called. Carraway? Okay. And he shut the door in my face. Next day, Gatsby phoned me. Are you leaving? I asked. No, old sport, of course not. I've sent all my old servants away. Daisy comes over in the afternoons. I didn't want them to talk about her in the village. Some friends of Wolfsheim are looking after me now. Gatsby was phoning with an invitation from Daisy. She wanted me to have lunch at her house the following day. Jordan would be there, and, of course, Gatsby, too. Daisy phoned me half an hour later. She seemed glad that I had accepted the invitation, but her voice was nervous and excited. The next day was the hottest day of the summer. The smallest movement made you hot and tired. I drove over to the Buchanan's house with Gatsby in his big yellow car. Its green leather seats were too hot to touch. The room where Daisy and Jordan were sitting was dark and cool. The two girls, both dressed in white, raised their hands lazily. It's too hot to move, they said together. Gatsby stood in the middle of the room in his elegant pink suit. He could not believe that he was in Daisy's own house. Daisy watched him and gave her sweet, exciting laugh. At that moment... Tom opened the door noisily and hurried into the room. "'Ah, Mr. Gatsby, hello, Nick,' he said, holding out his hand to me. "'Make us all a cold drink,' Daisy cried. As Tom left the room again, Daisy went over to Gatsby and kissed him on the mouth. "'You know I love you,' she said softly. When Tom brought in the drinks, we all drank greedily. We had lunch in the darkened dining room and drank a lot of cold beer." What are we going to do this afternoon? asked Daisy. And the day after that, and the next thirty years. Oh, it's so hot, Daisy went on, almost crying. I know. Why don't we drive to New York? She looked across the table into Gatsby's eyes. Ah, Daisy cried in her soft, exciting voice. You always look so cool. They looked at each other as though they were alone in the room. Suddenly, Tom Buchanan understood. His wife, Daisy, was in love with Gatsby. Tom's mouth opened a little. He looked first at Gatsby, and then at Daisy. Tom stood up. All right, then, he said in a hard voice. We're going to town. Let's go. The girls went upstairs to get ready. We went out onto the porch. Shall we take anything with us to drink? Daisy called down. I'll get some whiskey, Tom answered. Gatsby turned to me and said, I can't say anything to him in his house, old sport. I think Daisy's voice told him everything, I said. Well, she's always had everything she's wanted, Gatsby went on. Daisy's voice is full of money, he added. That was it. Daisy's charm was the charm of the rich and spoiled. Tom came out of the house with the whiskey wrapped in a towel. Daisy and Jordan followed him, looking cool and charming in their white dresses. Shall we all go in my car? said Gatsby. You take my car, Tom said in a loud voice to Gatsby. Come on, Daisy. I'll take you in this yellow one, he added, 
walking towards Gatsby's car, but Daisy moved away from her husband. No, Tom, you take Nick and Jordan. We'll follow you. And she pushed Gatsby towards the Buchanan's small blue car. Jordan, Tom, and I got into the front seat of Gatsby's car. Did you see that? Tom asked us angrily. Where did Daisy find a man like that? He's an Oxford man, said Jordan. Like hell he is. He wears a pink suit, Tom said angrily. I'm beginning to find out the truth about Gatsby, and it's not very pleasant. We were all hot and bad-tempered by now. When Tom reached Wilson's garage, he had to stop for gas. Wilson came out slowly and stood in the hot sun. He looked very ill. Well, come on, Tom shouted. Have I got to get the gas myself? I'm sick, said Wilson. I've got to get away. When can you sell me your old car? Next week, Tom said quickly. What about buying this yellow one? I got it last week. Why are you going away? My wife and I are going west, Wilson said. I'm getting her away from here. I found out something. Tom stared at him. Never mind about that. What do I owe you? He said in a hard, cold voice. As Tom was giving Wilson the money, Gatsby and Daisy drove by in the blue car. At the same moment, I saw Myrtle Wilson looking down at Jordan from an upstairs window. There was a look of terrible jealousy on Myrtle Wilson's face. She thought Jordan was Tom's wife. Tom did not see Myrtle. He was thinking about what Wilson had said. In one afternoon, Tom seemed to be losing his wife and his mistress, too. He drove on, much too fast, until he was beside the blue car. Gatsby stopped, and Daisy called out, "'Where are you going? It's so hot. We'll drive around and meet you later.' But Tom wanted to stay near Daisy and Gatsby. After some argument, we all drove to the Plaza Hotel. We took a room there so that we could have a drink. It was a crazy idea. The room was large, but it was very hot. We opened all the windows, but it made no difference. Oh, it's so hot, said Daisy. Why did we come here? Stop talking about the heat. You make it worse, said Tom, putting the bottle of whiskey on the table. Why not leave her alone, old sport, said Gatsby. You wanted to come, you know. I don't like being called old sport, said Tom in a bad-tempered way. Where did you learn to say that? If you're rude, Tom, I won't stay a minute, Daisy said. Why don't you phone for some ice? We sat in silence, waiting for the waiter to bring the ice. Then Tom looked at Gatsby and said, By the way, Mr. Gatsby, you were at Oxford, weren't you? Yes, I went there. The waiter came in with the ice. When he had gone, Tom said, When were you there, exactly? It was in 1919, Gatsby replied quietly. I was only there for five months. American officers were able to go to an English university after the war. So that story was true. I was glad. Daisy got up with a smile. Open the whiskey, Tom, she said, and I'll make everyone a drink. Wait a minute, said Tom. I've one more question to ask Mr. Gatsby. Go on, said Gatsby politely. What kind of trouble are you trying to make between me and my wife? Stop it, please, Tom, said Daisy quickly. Why should I? Tom shouted. Have I got to watch a nobody from nowhere make love to my wife and say nothing? Now listen, said Gatsby. I've got something to tell you, old sport. Oh, please don't say anything, Daisy said. Why don't we all go home? It's too hot to argue. I want Mr. Gatsby to give me an answer to my question, Tom said loudly. Your wife doesn't love you, said Gatsby. She's never loved you. She loved me. You're crazy, cried Tom, jumping to his feet. It's the truth, said Gatsby. We've loved each other for five years, old sport, and you didn't know. I tell you, you're crazy, Tom shouted again. Daisy loved me when she married me, and she loves me now. And I love Daisy, too. I always have. 
She knows that. Gatsby walked over to Daisy and stood beside her. Tell him the truth. Tell him you never loved him, he said. Daisy looked at each one of us unhappily. I never loved him, she said slowly. Then Daisy turned to Gatsby with a frightened, unhappy look in her eyes. Oh, you want too much, Jay, she cried. I love you now. Isn't that enough? She began to cry. I did love Tom once, but I loved you, too. You love me, too? Gatsby repeated slowly. I can't say I never loved Tom. It wouldn't be true, Daisy said sadly. Of course it wouldn't, said Tom. Now I'm taking you home, Daisy. You don't understand, Gatsby said quickly. Daisy's leaving you. Nonsense. Yes, I am, said Daisy, speaking with difficulty. You're leaving me for a little crook, Tom shouted. He's a bootlegger. He's a friend of Meyer Wolfsheim. I've been hearing all about you, Mr. Gatsby. You and your friends ought to be in jail. I looked at Gatsby. His face was hard, with a terrible expression. I could believe then that he had killed a man. He started to talk to Daisy, quickly, excitedly. Daisy did not seem to be listening. On that hot afternoon, Gatsby's dream was slipping farther and farther away from him. Please, Jay, Daisy said suddenly. Don't say any more. You must stop all this, please. Tom smiled. He knew that he had won. You go home, Daisy, he said in a quiet voice. Go with Mr. Gatsby in his car. He won't trouble you again. And slowly, sadly, Daisy and Gatsby had gone. It was seven o'clock when Jordan and I left the hotel with Tom. As we drove back over the bridge, I remembered that it was my thirtieth birthday. I felt sad and tired. Nine. Death in the Evening We saw the quiet crowd of people outside Wilson's garage from some distance away. Well, looks like an accident, Tom said. Wilson will have some repair work at last. Tom slowed down. When he saw the looks on the people's faces, he stopped the car. Inside the garage, someone was crying, Oh my God, oh my God, over and over again. There's some bad trouble here, Tom said excitedly. We got out of the car, and Tom pushed through the crowd into the garage. Myrtle Wilson's body, wrapped in a blanket, lay on a table by the wall. Her mouth was open, and a little blood was coming from it. Tom stood there, looking down at her. Oh, my God, my God, repeated Wilson, his hands over his face. Tom looked round the garage slowly. He went up to a policeman who was writing in a notebook. What happened? Tom asked him. Car hit her, the policeman said. She ran out into the road and was killed at once. The car didn't stop. The car was coming from New York, said someone in the crowd. It was a big yellow car, going about sixty. Wilson looked up and shouted out. You don't have to tell me what color it was. I know it was a yellow cow, all right. Listen, Tom said, going over to Wilson. I've just got here. That yellow car I was driving this afternoon wasn't mine, do you hear? Wilson took no notice. Let's get out, Tom said to me, and we pushed our way back through the crowd. Tom drove on slowly at first, then faster. When I looked at him, I saw that he was crying. That Gatsby... The goddamned coward, Tom cried. He killed Myrtle. He killed her, and he didn't stop his car. Later, I heard what had happened. Wilson had at last found out that Myrtle had a lover. She refused to tell Wilson the man's name, so Wilson had locked her in her bedroom for several hours. Just before seven, someone had heard Myrtle cry out, Beat me, hit me, you dirty little coward. 
Then Myrtle had rushed out into the evening darkness. She had been shouting and waving her arms. Had she wanted the yellow car to stop? Myrtle Wilson was killed instantly, and her blood ran onto the dusty road. Tom stopped his car outside his house and looked up at a lighted window. Daisy's home, he said. Then he looked at me and said, I'm sorry, Nick, I should have taken you to West Egg. I'll phone for a taxi to take you home. Come in and have some supper. No, thanks, I said. I'll wait outside. Jordan put a hand on my arm. Do come in. It's only half past nine, she said. I shook my head. I was feeling tired and sick. I had had enough of the Buchanans for one day. Jordan looked at me for a moment. Then she followed Tom quickly into the house. That was the last time I saw her. I walked slowly down the drive to wait for the taxi by the gate. Gatsby stepped out onto the path in front of me. His pink suit shone in the moonlight. What are you doing here? I asked in surprise. Just standing here, old sport. Was, uh... Was she killed? Gatsby asked slowly. Yes. I thought so. That's what I told Daisy. I got back to West Egg and put the car in the garage, Gatsby went on. I don't think anyone saw us. I stared at Gatsby, feeling that I hated him. How the hell did it happen? I asked angrily. Well, I tried to turn the wheel, Gatsby began. I suddenly guessed the truth. Was Daisy driving? Yes, said Gatsby after a moment. But of course I'll say I was. Daisy was very upset when we left New York. I thought driving would calm her down. That woman rushed into the road just as a car was coming the other way. I think she wanted us to stop. Daisy turned towards the other car and then turned back. She was very frightened. I put my hand on the wheel, but the woman was already under the car. Daisy wouldn't stop, Gatsby explained. Then she felt faint and I drove home. I'm waiting here now in case Tom makes any trouble. Tom's not thinking about Daisy, I said. Then I thought for a moment. What would Tom do if he found out that Daisy had been driving? Would he believe that Myrtle's death had been an accident? You wait here, I said to Gatsby. I'll go back to the house and see what's going on. The light was on in the kitchen. Daisy and Tom were sitting opposite each other at the kitchen table. Tom was talking and holding Daisy's hand. Daisy looked up at Tom and nodded her head. They looked as though they belonged to each other. They looked as though they were planning something. I went back to Gatsby, who was standing where I had left him. I could hear the sound of my taxi. It's all quiet, I said. You'd better come home with me. Gatsby shook his head. I'll wait here till they go to bed. Daisy may need me. Good night, old sport. Gatsby put his hands in the pockets of his pink suit. I left him standing there in the moonlight. Ten. The End of a Dream I slept badly that night. I had terrible, frightening dreams. Just before dawn, I heard a taxi driving up to Gatsby's house. I dressed and went over there at once. The front door was open. Gatsby was sitting in the hall, still wearing his pink suit. Nothing happened, said Gatsby sadly. At four o'clock, she came to the window for a moment. Then she turned out the light. We looked round the house for a cigarette. There was dust everywhere. We sat smoking in the darkness. You ought to go away, I told Gatsby. The police are sure to find out the yellow car is yours. Go away? Of course I can't, old sport. I must find out what Daisy wants to do. Gatsby began to tell me about Daisy. He told me how he had first been excited by her beauty and by her money. Gatsby had been a young man without money, and he had no hope of getting any. One October night, he and Daisy had become lovers. 
Then he had fallen in love with Daisy. And Daisy, a girl who had everything she wanted, fell in love with him. Life for Gatsby became more and more unreal. He spent hours telling Daisy about his dreams for the future, and, of course, she listened to him. Then Gatsby had to go to the war. When he came back, Tom and Daisy were on their honeymoon. The house began to fill with the pale light of dawn. Birds began to sing in Gatsby's garden. I don't believe she ever loved him, Gatsby said. You mustn't take any notice of what she said this afternoon. She was excited and Tom frightened her. Gatsby and I had breakfast together, and then we went into the garden. The air was cooler. Summer was nearly over. The gardener came up to us and said, I'm going to take the water out of the swimming pool, Mr. Gatsby. The leaves will be falling soon. Don't do it today, Gatsby said. I haven't used that pool all summer. It was time for me to go to work. But I didn't want to work, and I didn't want to leave Gatsby alone. I'll phone you, I told him. Do, old sport. I suppose Daisy will phone, too. I suppose so. We shook hands, and I began to walk away. Then I stopped and shouted back across the lawn. They're no good, Gatsby. You're better than all of them. It was the only compliment I ever paid, Gatsby. But I've always been glad I said it. Gatsby gave me a big smile and raised his hand. His pink suit was bright against the white steps. Goodbye, I called. Thank you, Gatsby. Wilson had cried for Myrtle all night. Then he began to talk to his neighbors. Two months ago, Myrtle had come back from New York with a bruised face. Later, Wilson had found an expensive dog collar in Myrtle's desk. He bought it for her, Wilson said. He bought it for her, and then he killed her. He murdered her. The man in the yellow car. She ran out to speak to him, and he wouldn't stop. Somehow, Wilson found out who owned the yellow car. At half past two on the day after Myrtle had been killed, Wilson went to West Egg. He asked the way to Gatsby's house. At two o'clock, Gatsby had gone down to his swimming pool with an airbed. He told his servants to call him if anyone phoned. No one phoned. His dream was over. I couldn't do much work that day. I got back to West Egg by about half past four. Gatsby wasn't in the house. One of the servants told me he had not come back from the swimming pool. We hurried down to the pool. The airbed was moving slowly round and round. There was a little blood in the water and Gatsby lay on the airbed, dead. As we carried Gatsby's body up to the house, we saw Wilson lying on the grass. Wilson had shot Gatsby, and had then shot himself. At the inquest, Myrtle's sisters swore that Myrtle had never known Gatsby. She said, too, that Wilson and his wife had been completely happy. So Wilson was called a man made mad with grief, and the case was closed. About half an hour after we had found Gatsby, I phoned Daisy. Mr. and Mrs. Buchanan went away this afternoon, a servant told me. They will be away for some time. Did they leave an address? I asked. No, the servant replied. Have you any idea where they are? I don't know, sir. I'm very sorry. I felt that I had to tell someone about Gatsby. I thought of Meyer Wolfsheim. I phoned him, but he had already left his office. The following morning, I sent a servant to New York with a letter. Wolfsheim sent back a very short answer. Dear Mr. Carraway, this has been a great shock to me. I cannot go to the funeral, as I am very busy. I would rather not visit the house. I'll remember him as he was. Yours truly, Meyer Wolfsheim. All that day and the next, I had to answer the questions of the police and the reporters. The news of Gatsby's death was in all the papers. But Daisy didn't phone. Then a telegram arrived from Henry Gatz. He had read the news of his son's death in a Chicago newspaper.
he was coming to the funeral. The truth was that Jay Gatsby had started life as James Gatz. He was the son of a poor farmer in the Middle West. He had left home when he was sixteen. For a year, James Gatz had lived near Lake Superior, working as a fisherman. Gatz had become a good-looking young man, popular with women. He had gone to college, but had only stayed there for two weeks. James Gatz was already ambitious. He was dreaming of success. One morning, Gatz saw Dan Cody's big white yacht near the shore. Gatz found a boat and sailed over to the yacht to ask for a job. Dan Cody asked a few questions. Gatz told Dan Cody that his name was Jay Gatsby. Cody saw that the young man with the pleasant smile was quick and ambitious. When the yacht sailed, Jay Gatsby went with it. Gatsby stayed with Cody for five years until the old man died. Gatsby didn't get any of the old man's money, but Gatsby had learnt how the rich live. Gatsby now knew what he wanted. Mr. Henry Gatz was already in tears when he arrived for the funeral. He was an old man and was so upset that he could hardly stand. But when he had looked round the house, he became more cheerful. Jimmy did well out here in the east, Mr. Gatz said. This is where he made all his money. He was a good boy, and he had a great future. He could have done something really good for his country. I was proud of my boy, Mr. Carraway. This has been a terrible shock to me. On the day of the funeral, it rained and rained. At three o'clock, the minister arrived. Gatsby's father and I waited for the other mourners. After half an hour, the minister began to look at his watch. We waited a little longer, but nobody came. It was raining hard when we reached the cemetery. As we walked towards the grave, I heard someone following us. It was the fat man with glasses I had seen in Gatsby's library three months before. As we stood by the grave, I saw that Daisy hadn't sent a flower or a message. After the funeral, the fat man said, I'm sorry, I couldn't get to the house. That's all right, I said. Nobody came to the house. The fat man stared. My God, he said, and hundreds of people used to go there. What friends! Eleven. I go back to the West. And that is the end of Gatsby's story. After Gatsby's death, I couldn't live on Long Island any longer. I wanted to go back to the West. I wanted to go back to where we all came from. I wanted to return to the place where I felt happiest. I saw Tom Buchanan once more in New York before I left. When he stopped and held out his hand, I put my hands behind my back. What's the matter, Nick? he asked. Won't you shake hands with me? You know what I think of you, I answered. What did you say to Wilson that afternoon? Tom stared at me, and I knew I had guessed right. Tom took hold of my arm. Listen, he said. I told Wilson the truth. He came into our house with a gun. He would have killed one of us if I hadn't told him who owned the yellow car. And why shouldn't I have told him? Tom went on. That Gatsby made a fool of you and of Daisy, too. But he was tough, and he killed Myrtle like a dog. There was nothing I could say. I knew the truth, but I could never tell it. Tom had done what he wanted to do. Got rid of Gatsby. Tom and Daisy were rich, careless people. They took what they wanted and destroyed what they didn't need. Then they went away, leaving others to clear up the mess. Gatsby's house was empty when I left, and the grass had grown very long. On my last night, I stood in the garden, thinking about Gatsby and his dream. Gatsby had believed in his dream. He had followed it and nearly made it come true. Everybody has a dream. And, like Gatsby, we must all follow our dream wherever it takes us. Some unpleasant people became part of Gatsby's dream, but he cannot be blamed for that. 
Gatsby was a success in the end, wasn't he?